1 Thessalonians, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep at death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we, who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. On behalf of Kendra Mills and the fa family of Ted, thank you all for coming to Ted's celebration of life. What a wonderful life and a perfect setting here at the Chesapeake Bay. The site of many fishing trips for Ted. Quick fishing story, and actually the only one I have of uh, my brother-in-law. I should call him my special brother. When you share in-laws with someone, they're your special brother. <laughs> so we were at Myrtle Beach, site of many, many family vacations, and 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 I look behind me, and, and Ted's halfway up the beach. And I look back, and I look back for Ted, and. Next thing I know, as Ted's pretty much on the beach, he calls back, shark! So that's the only fishing story. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'd like to bring up Mr. Terry Phillips, who will read uh, from John 14. Like to add to your welcome this morning, We've gathered today, uh, together to remember Dr. Edward M. Mills, or as we know him, simply as Ted. Your presence uh, here today is an affirmation of your love and your support to this family. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Although the family may not remember every word that's shared today, they will remember your presence for the rest of their lives. Let's uh, join together for a time of prayer as we start. Almighty Heavenly Father, we gather here today in, in this place at this time to honor and to remember the life of Ted Mills. Father, we're reminded we're not alone here, but your spirit gathers with us. And Lord, it's my prayer that you would bring comfort and strength and peace in times like this. Might you be with us. Might we see you and be drawn closer to you today. We pray in that name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Mills family have been very dear friends to Kathy and me for, for decades. It's my privilege, it's an honor to be asked to say a few words today. Ted was born on uh, May 31st, 1969. And he died on October 14th, 2020. His lifespan here in, in our world, uh, his lifespan 51 years, four months, and 20 days. Ted's early years were spent here in Cambridge. It is fitting uh, that Kendra wanted to have the, the service here in this place right on the shores of the job tank. Rage and Judy moved away from Cambridge and 1976, taking six-year-old Ted and his siblings to their new home in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. 
And although he moved away as a long uh, as a young child, Cambridge and Maryland were always a special spot. He would return regularly to visit with family. There's one one story that I, I remember where as Kathy and I, before we had any children, had a, had a little two-seater MG convertible, a, a sports car designed to carry two people. And we were visiting Ridge and Judy, and, and Ted needed a ride back to, to Maryland to visit with grandparents or grandmother or, or other family. And so we, we loaded him up in the back ledge of this car and would have been arrested today for transporting a child in that manner. But uh, I still remember those days. And Ted was just, just well behaved and uh, a good natured kid. And I, I can remember Ted as a child and, and obviously later in life interacted with him as an adult as well. Ted's life has taken him to many cities, states, and countries. Dr. Edward M. Mills. I've only recently learned of some of Ted's accomplishments. He began his education right here in Cambridge at a school just almost a stone's throw from here, a little more than that, but at Sandy Hill Elementary School. Continuing his early education in North Carolina before graduating from Crothersville High School in, in Indiana. Ted continued his education at Franklin College before receiving his doctorate degree from Purdue University in Lafayette, Indiana. Ted was married to Kendra K. Carr, July 16, 1994. Kendra and Ted met each other in their teenage years, I'm told. And I understand that they were friends for years. I was also told they remained to be good friends until <laughs> then one day, Ted came home and announced to his mom and dad, said, uh, Mom, Dad, Kendra and I are more than friends. <laughs> and I guess the rest is history. But Ted and Kendra shared their shared life was one of travel, love of international cuisine, cooking, and Kendra remained by Ted through thick and thin, sickness and health. She was patient and supportive of her husband as he lost his eyesight and finally lost his battle with his illness. Kendra, I pray that, that God will bring you comfort and continue to be your strength in these difficult days. Ted had work experiences that took him to work with Eli Lilly, the National Institute of Health, and Ted had his research published in professional journals. He had traveled internationally through Europe, Canada, Mexico, Japan, probably some other countries that I've missed. His work at the University of Texas was well respected by all of his peers, by the leadership there. Dr. Mills ran a state-of-the-art laboratory at the university. He was well respected. He was known as a doctor, a scientist, researcher, teacher, mentor. But to us, he was known as Ted. Ted was a humble, normal, good, all around. He was a research scientist studying human cells. His career allowed him to study God's creation to a depth that is unknown to most of us. Reg shared with me that Ted told him, he said, uh, 
the more I learn how the body works, the more I believe in God. Proverbs 9.10 states, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Ted Mills, a dedicated husband, a great brother, a loving son, nephew, a good friend. We loved him, and we miss him. We miss our interactions with him, the phone calls, his humor. Ted always had a way of making us laugh. remember Ted and how he interacted with each one of us as individuals. And we're here today because God has chosen to allow our life's path, our life paths to be intertwined with the life of Ted Mills. Our lives have been blessed through the life of Ted Mills. It is natural to be sad, shaken, shattered when we lose a loved one to earthly death. Kendra, Rich, Judy, Richard, Luke, I know your hearts are broken. It is during times like this that we turn to God for strength, for comfort. I am reminded comforted that his word, God's word is as relevant and fresh to us today as it was when it was written. As I close my comments today, I'd like to share some words found in the Gospel of John. John 14. Jesus. Jesus' words. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe You believe in God, also believe in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. May God bless you during these difficult times. Thank you, sir. May have Michael Feldman come come up and read some words.
Reflecting back, I was not scared to move to Maryland. I knew we needed to move from family so Ted could follow his dreams. We were also being, we were also able to be near family and close to his newfound biological mom, dad, brother, and grandparents. We loved our time in Maryland. Then we became longhorns. We drove 24 hours in two days with two cats and enough pack with us to get us by without furniture for a week to a house that we had never seen. Ted always seemed to have faith that everything was going to work out. We grew up together. He taught me so much. He was the funniest person I know. So witty, even though some of his lines were stolen from Chevy Chase. <laughs> he was horrible at keeping a secret. Oh, yes. <laughs> he was a great cook, a great cat dad, the best travel partner. He was a fantastic researcher, professor, mentor, and drummer. I was so proud of him for all of his academic achievements, and equally so when he was sitting behind the kit. I miss my best friend. Michael come back for some of his own words. This whole time I've been uh, preparing to come here and I apologize, I'm going to speak a bit haltingly. Um, I couldn't prepare to speak. Um, I speak all day long, I can't <laughs> stop talking, for both of you know me, um, about whatever, but somehow when it came to speaking to you about Ted, it, it, the words, the, the idea, the thought of it became very gray and I couldn't quite find my way through until I started driving this morning. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I got in the car, I was listening to actually one of our songs, try to prepare, all of a sudden this flood of Ted came back to me. So um, there are two things that, um, that I just wanted to highlight about my time with Ted, and I think most of you, though probably in different um, ways, had a very similar experience. Um, Ted was an incredible communicator, and he had an endless curiosity. Um, I, I can't tell you how many conversations I watched him have with people, where he was so engrossed with them and what they thought, and and asking questions. They clearly. I felt like the only person in the world when he was talking to me. Um, and that communication really uh, uh, extended well beyond words. Um, Ted and I spent unbelievable amounts of time together um, when he wasn't with Dan or Kendra. Um, and, uh, and I learned so much from that time, but what I learned most of all was no idea was a bad idea. Let's try this. Let's work through this idea. Um, musically, intellectually, we talk about the most amazing topics and his knowledge and zest for information and, and acceptance of people and willingness to, to open his mind to things taught me more lessons than I could possibly imagine. Um, but he also taught me something else. He, uh, he taught me how to communicate in a way with him musically that had nothing to do with words. It had nothing to do with anything else other than experiencing what we were experiencing in that moment. It was about being present and being present with the people around you. And that's what was the genesis of, of ultimately what became our friendship and the band and everything that, that passed after that point. We just had a connection. I could talk to him without talking to him. And it was so much fun. We used to play in the basement with just drums and guitar. And I didn't know what, he, what I was doing, but he was just going. And, and it, it, it 
kept going and going, and thankfully we came across Shane, and, and then it picked up momentum, and then we ran into Josh, and bam, it was like this experience that I, I, I don't think many people are lucky enough to have, and certainly I, I don't know that we'll ever be lucky enough to have something like that again. Um, and, and the most important part of that is that communication. We were playing a gig, Ted and I, Literally, I, I don't think we ever said a crossword between us. And we were setting up for a gig one night, and I'm sure, you know, squirrel ran by. God knows what happened, and we got in a little tit. And we weren't talking to each other. We showed up for the gig, and we weren't talking to each other. Not talking to each other. Not looking at each other. It's the only time in my life that this has happened with him. This is years into our friendship, and, and it was just... I was so obstinate and angry and whatever it was, and clearly he was feeling the same thing. And we didn't talk to each other, we didn't talk to each other, I wouldn't look at him, he wouldn't look at me. We set up at a gig, like mumbling around, we're talking to those guys, and all of a sudden we start playing. I didn't look at him, he didn't look at me. And we were talking the entire time from the minute we started playing. I never had to say a word. And as soon as we finished the first set, we both smiled walked over and hugged each other. It was just one of those moments that I'll never forget. I didn't need words to communicate with him. He had multiple levels on which he could communicate. We could do the silly humor, the slapstick, and, and, and everything in between. And that was something really beautiful. Um, the other thing about him is He's one of the most brilliant guys I've ever met. And I think that brilliance um, sometimes got the better of him and, and it became a little absent-minded professor. <laughs> so another gig situation. Um, for those of you who've heard the story, I apologize. Um, we get down to the gig and we're setting up and we're ready to go and we're all geared up and. Ted's got the drum set set up and he sits down and we're ready to hit the first song and he looks at us and he's like, I don't have any drumsticks. <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay. So he picks up the phone, calls Kendra, who is, you know, about a half an hour from all of our homes, about to arrive at the bar to hear us play. Kendra, could you go home and get my drumsticks, please? So she turns around. 40 minutes back, 40 minutes back, and we're sitting there, okay, well, what are we gonna do? Next thing you know, you hear, Pence. Okay, I guess we're ready to go. Ted picked up two knives from the next table, <laughs> carried on with the gig, and it was as if nothing ever happened. When Kendra showed up, she walked in, a little bit less than pleased, I think. <laughs> and, uh, cause he, She's like, what? How are they playing? Was it, you know, why did I have to run back? He's, it, he played the whole the whole gig with the knives. <laughs> so we had the opportunity to go down for his fiftieth birthday. Um, Kendra made him accept the fact that we were coming in. Shane and I flew in from the coast, so to speak, and Josh was there, and we went over to the house. And on my way down, excuse me, I missed the actually the point of the story. Um, I'm, so ever since that day, just in case Ted forgot <laughs> drumsticks, I've always carried a pair of drumsticks in my bag. Since that day, for every gig, every show, every practice, every everything, I've had a pair of drumsticks. Last night I was packing my truck for a gig today, and I'm trying to put this bag in and it won't go. I can't figure out why it won't go. Shoving and shoving, it's just not going. And I'm like, oh, there's a pocket. Let me open this up. It's a so, as we're getting ready to fly down for his 50th birthday, and I'm going through TSA. The, you know, the light goes off and starts to step over here. Like, yeah, you know, go, sure. There's something in your bag we need to check for. Okay, go ahead. Pulls out a silver knife, <laughs> which I was bringing down to 
Ted, which was the knife from that show, which I had also kept in my bag for all of those years. Unfortunately, she had to confiscate it. <clears throat> However, I got a great picture of her smiling, holding the knife, <laughs> and I was able to just share that with him. And um, I, I just want to say thank you to, to Andrew, to all of you, for bringing this guy to my life. However, this happened. Um, I'm better for the experience. I'm a better person for having known him. Um, I, I know limitations that uh, I didn't know existed until I saw that guy work on every level, food, intellect, humor, humanity, and love. He taught me so much, so thank you. Nowadays, uh, I was I was born Luke. My parents called me Luke when Ted and Rich and I were little. Uh, when I started high school, which was in uh, '88 or whatever, 1990. Now I started going by Reginald, but you know names names stay with you. Um, when I moved to the South, uh, which was now 15, 20 years ago, they went from Reginald to Reggie. It wasn't my choice, but after. You know, six months of saying, you know, hi, I'm Reginald, and people saying, hi, Reggie, good to meet you. I was like, all right, I guess I'm Reggie now. That's, that's fine. I can work with that. Um, just real quick, I want to say thanks to my cousins, Danny and Dougie, for helping bring out some tables and chairs and stuff and helping make this happen because because this isn't our home anymore. Um, it's got a lot of memories for us and a lot of nostalgia, but um, we're here for it to be Ted's resting place, and I appreciate you guys supporting us in that. Um, I wrote a few things down because I know I wouldn't be able to think of it while I'm standing up here. It's titled Eulogy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've grown up around death. Uh, you could say my dad was in the business. And I remember being Sam's age and sitting on a hospital bed, probably with somebody who's dying, and I'm watching TV or whatever, and dad's there counseling them. And that kind of, kind of experience wasn't in itself formative. It wasn't shocking. It was normal. Um, it just seemed every day. And, and growing up as a teenager, when a lot of people face end-of-life crises, and I've seen this at every walk of life and every age, uh, people have to come to terms with death. And I never, I mean, I think I did when I was very, very little. And, and as a young adult, that wasn't something that preoccupied me or concerned me. And uh, as a young adult, I just dove off into the world without a care because I knew I had this great support behind me if I ever fell. And I wasn't worried about dying. Um, and I think that was unusual. But it's, it, I think, also can be explained by my, my life. And I don't know how mom and dad conveyed such uh, a appreciation I've always had um, because I don't remember them ever saying to their starving kids in, in Asia or you know that there's suffering in the world um, and yet somehow I grew up with this real fundamental appreciation for everything that I have and it's something I've taken with me everywhere and I think if you look at a lot of the choices I've made I spent most of my 20s wandering all over the country and never settling down or having roots. And you could say it's because I was ungrateful or think that. Um, but the fact is, it's because I appreciated so much that how blessed we are and how much every day is a gift. I didn't, I wasn't very quick to buy into a career or a home or a lifestyle um, because I just wanted to live in every moment. And yet somehow, Thinking I understood death, and thinking I appreciated what I had, I've never felt anything like this. All of my experiences and all my travels, they've been like building blocks. I thought they were part of what made me who I am. All the people I've met, experiences, 
There are pieces of my life. This is something missing. It's a hollow place. And I know enough to know I'm not going to feel that emptiness all the time. But nothing's going to fill it. I'm confident there's always going to be this little piece missing. For all the gratitude I know that I've experienced, I've never selfishly wanted anything more than just more memories, more rush videos, <laughs> you know, more stupid jokes, more just totally unembarrassed faux pas <laughs> to be able to just step in it like nobody could but Ted. <laughs> And yet just laugh at it and not let it weigh him down. Just, oh, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I did buy those tickets for the wrong year. And it's like, oh, fly, you know? And I never realized before, you know, Ted left home for college in 87 when I was 12. And we never lived together again. And so, he would come home sometimes to visit, or we would meet over the holidays. And as an adult, I would go to D.C. or Texas and occasionally, you know, visit. Uh, I spent a week with him in his dormitory when he was in college. But I never realized how much of my day-to-day -day life he was in my consciousness. Because whenever I go to a new restaurant or I meet somebody interesting, I think, oh, I can't wait. You know, Ted would love to meet this guy. Ted comes to Athens, I need to hook him up with this guy to hang out. We need to go to this restaurant. You know, even this morning, I saw that Neil Peart's cars are being auctioned off. Sports cars, right? And Neil Peart. And my first instinct is, oh, I need to, you know. Ted's not going to have the chance to, you know, wish he could, or at least suggest he's interested in, in buying one of those. Um, there's no way to express everything we're all feeling this morning. Um, but I appreciate everybody coming together and taking the time to at least have this moment together to, to make an attempt. And I'm sure we'll be doing this again in, in small groups as long as we all know each other. Thank you. So bear with us. <laughs> so uh, I'm here because 21 years ago, Ted placed an ad in the paper in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and I was newly back to the area, and I remember driving out to Mrs. Ward's, this is compound out in Maryland, gorgeous spot where we, Ted was the one who made that arrangement, right? Only Ted, <laughs> only Ted could like, because he knew everyone, he had so many layers, he just, people gravitated towards him. There was like this wealthy, eccentric, kind of out there lady, who had this huge four acre estate. And she's like, yeah, you can bring your rock band and practice anytime you want. <laughs> it was wonderful. And we had to clean up and we had to uh, do things here and there. But it was, again, like this lightning in a bottle that we had. And really it was because Ted was the one who initiated it with that ad. And I remember when I first came out and I met these guys, I was like, I, I click with these guys, this is cool. And I don't know what else is, who else is interviewing, who else is on the table, who they're thinking about. But Ted was the one, the last thing he said to me, um, 
as I'm walking away, like, nice to meet you guys. I don't know if I'm going to hear from you again. Who knows what's going to come of this? He's like, Shane, I just want to tell you, you know, we just want to play music, live in the moment, and not have a lot of ego. You know, that was, so his thing was like, ego free. Because I mean, they, they played, you know, other cats were some, you know, there could be some egos involved. I mean, we, we played with some guys, but that was the crux of our band is that we didn't have agendas, we just enjoyed the moment. And, um, and, and I appreciate it. And every, I can't, I'm not gonna repeat all the brilliant stuff that Mike said, because he nailed it. Uh, but uh, the song we're gonna play too, this is, this is my other Ted story, which is kind of funny. Um, a guy that I knew from Boston actually wrote this song, and then we recorded it um, on a record. And uh, he called me screaming at me. I messed up his words. Um, and Ted knew this guy from Boston too, ironically, also who Sarah knows and other people know. Again, Ted knows everybody. But so today, uh, we just rewrote the whole song completely, so don't tell Dan. You might get in trouble again, but I think he's happy about it too. So. And the only one other thing I want to say, uh, which I really appreciate, is as I read the wonderful tribute from one of the senior people at UT about Ted and about like. I didn't know the extent of his background and going to Purdue and, and all the work and how he kind of pivoted halfway to get into mitochondrial DNA and all of this stuff. And um, I had to reread some of those paragraphs many, many times. And I just was like, ah, this is like when he tried to explain it to me. Again, was, all I knew was journal nature and something about giving mice ecstasy. Which, <laughs> that's pretty much it. And then, but then I was like, I did not for a moment expect to get any kind of like or a shout out to the band. And then the last paragraph is all about the band. That's obviously the most important, you know? And it was great. It was really, uh, you know, we, we had, we went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on the corporate jet. We went to Atlanta. We went to New York. Um, we played the beach. We played every, we played so much. And, and at the core, when Ted um, had to step away from it, that's when not replace it. We played with some amazing drummers, but his his core essence, his personality, and just his vibe. The most musical drummer I've ever played with who could communicate, like Mike said, but came up with musical ideas that a simple song became so much more interesting because he was so interesting. You know, he was just this guy that had so many stories and so many points of view that he brought to things. So um, I, I miss you, Ted. I love you, Ted. And uh, we're going to play this song for you. And don't tell Pluto. Okay. Guy for a while. He was the drummer in my band, all printed, a smart guy, and a scientist. We would jam at Mrs. Ward's. We would write funny songs. We would invest in corporate rock group in the land. I roll off of you. Scientist of Brenton. He did experiments at NIE on mitochondria, uncoupling proteins, or UCPs. He got a real boost in his stature when the prestigious journal Nature wrote about his mice that were all doped up on E. <laughs> he sang lies, lies, lies. Austin, 
then came calling. He looked at Kendra, then he started bawling, saying, how, how can I leave this amazing band with great musical geniuses? That's not true. I made that up. He didn't blink. He's like, I'm out of here. It's time to jump down to Austin for a tenured teaching position. Yeah. He sang that. South by to rock and roll and reunite. He had a birthday the last two years, and we showed up and we drank some beers. Ten Kenneth Kendra took us out for a couple of good bites. But our friend Ted is gone too soon, and for our band, he was a boom, a great scientist, and a great friend on the drum. And until we play again, I will think of you often, Ted, my friend. And I'll smile just like those mice that you drug. <laughs> such a great drummer, you know, he uh, had a medical condition when he was a young child, and uh, arms kind of atrophied a bit, and they had to work with him quite a lot, and they told us he'd never be very coordinated. Showed him so his didn't he? Yeah, <laughs> sure did. Those of you that know me will be uh, surprised and amazed that I'm going to be so brief. And those of you that don't know me will be glad. I just felt like, not that I had anything particular to say, but I just felt like if you know Ted's life narrative, I think it needed to be said, Ted, at the end of the day, you had a mom and a dad who loved you and who were missing you every day. And I hope you can understand what I mean by that.
Ted had friends and associates in many places around the world. He never met a stranger and could and would strike up a conversation with anyone. Ted loved to meet and befriend the most unfortunate and humble among us. He was also crazy about cats, little kids, and BMWs. As his father-in-law, I always enjoyed telling people Dr. Mills was brilliant and very unassuming. He loved wearing jeans, playing drums, and fishing. Ted loved music. He and I would trade ideas of different kinds of music that we enjoyed. Sarah always liked to tell people that we were blessed for having two very good sons-in-laws, and Ted was one of them. Kendra's husband, Ted, never called me Pop, Sir, or Hey Dude. He called me Skip, and I liked that. We all sincerely loved Ted. My first memory that I can recall of Ted was opening my mail that he had sent me while he was away at Purdue. He was responding to my request for lyrics to my favorite YouTube song. He had already had the new album, and I hadn't yet, and he neatly wrote the lyrics in the smallest ink print that I had ever seen. <laughs> Ted would always answer my questions patiently while I struggled through high school chemistry. I don't know many grad students who would let their girlfriend's little sister tag along to parties, but he did me. Ted always made time for me. Ted grew to be the best big brother, an amazing uncle who would spoil my two daughters on early morning donut runs, <laughs> drum sessions, fishing, and teaching them inappropriate songs to <laughs> melt out while going down the hallway. He taught my oldest her first word, which was bird. He said it incessantly one week at the beach until she finally managed to say it. <laughs> Not only did Ted teach me science basics, but he taught me about music, cats, sarcasm, <laughs> making the best basmati rice. He attempted to teach me to drive a stick shift, and this may be the only lesson where his student failed. <laughs> taught me not to judge a restaurant by its outside, but by yelping its rating. He would drive an extra 30 minutes for peel and eat shrimp, or go on a quest for a four-star Jewish deli. I am blessed to have the means, I was blessed to have the means to drop everything in October to fly to Texas. I am grateful to have visited with Ted, even though his eyes were closed. I won't forget Kinder telling Ted that I was in the room, and he responded with a sleepy, hey, as he always did. His last moments will be something I will treasure. E even though I only saw Ted several times a year, it's hard to realize that I can't send him a text about a song. In fact, his last phone call to me was about an elephant, elephant documentary that he watched late one night on a Japanese TV channel. <laughs> he told me that I just had to watch it. Ted was giving, inviting, and always funny, or always making fun of me. I know that Ted fought a tough battle, but now he isn't. In fact, I am sure that as soon as Ted checked the Yelp rating for heaven, it was a solid, we have to go. I imagined him reaching the doors, and God took one look at him. And then God looked over his shoulder and shouted, Hey, Norma, the baloney king's here. <laughs> That's an inside story. <laughs> certainly here. <laughs> um, is there anyone else who would like to say any last minute words? If I may have the end come up to start talking and talk in circles and by the time he was done it would take you like five seconds to figure out what the hell he just said <laughs> and then you like started laughing and you couldn't stop um, and he was very good at these just sort of random silly little word plays like he would put the sound the in the middle of each syllable 
So like Kendra became Kevin Drubba. And Sarah and I, Sarah and I still can't say Kendra's name without calling her <laughs> Kevin Drubba. Uh, um, but I mean, his humor was a part of the fact that he was, he was just so smart, that's been said before, but his, his intellect was, it was kind of crazy. Like, it was like he was in this other gear that nobody else could access. You know, you go through first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, well, if you don't know about this because you don't want to have that <laughs> <laughs> And then like, you know, fifth gear, when that's where most of us end up, but like he had a sixth gear and he was just kind of always in it. Like when, whatever you were talking about, he would be able to analyze and understand sort of subtleties and just kind of bring it away. Um, and he was also very thoughtful, it's been mentioned before, his ability to talk about almost anything. Um, and we would have conversations, and he would explain scientific stuff to me, and a lot of it was a little bit over my head, but he would take the time to go into it, and I would ask questions, and he would find a way to make it uh, make sense. And he told me a story one time, uh, we talked on the phone, after he uh, lost his sight, about a lecture that he gave um, in which he wasn't able to use any of his normal tools and he just kind of taught off the cuff and everybody said it was like the best lecture that they ever heard uh, just because you know he didn't need the tools because he had everything he needed up here. Um, he was insanely talented. Obviously, you know, musically, I remember hearing him and playing drums in, the, in Franklin. They had a little band that would just screw around the pep bands and uh, they would go to the gym and we would go like shoot basketball and Ted and Dave and some other people would you know, play in the pep band. And it was just really cool to see. Like, you felt like you were in the presence of somebody who was actually like a, a legit magician. A mis well, magician. I was going to say musician, but that works Both. too. Yeah, yeah. True. Um, but his talents were kind of so varied. Like, obviously, he was a great drummer um, and a great scientist, but he was also a great cook. Uh, one, of the, one of my fondest memories is when um, Ted and I would spend a lot of time fishing together. Uh, sorry, Kendra and Sarah, for all of that. Uh, we would go, we would go up from DC to visit them in Gettysburg, and Ted and I would go fishing until like literally the point of, of darkness, and then come back from dinner. And so Kendra would be like, hmm, "Are we going to eat before midnight tonight? I don't know." Uh, but uh, Ted would love to. We love to experiment with new things. And one time he's like, "We got to make curry like from scratch." I'm like, "Okay, that sounds like fun. Like, how do you do that?" He's like, "Well, I got this recipe, and it's like." 27 ingredients. It included like grinding the spices, like all these spices that you didn't have, like grinding every individual spice, cooking them in the right order, and I mean just the, the lengths to which you would be willing to go to, to make a good meal. Uh, and then after, you know, he uh, had diabetes and he he was the first person who ever made, uh, was it, uh, cauliflower mashed potatoes for me. And I was like, that's actually really good. I've had it a number of times, but never as good as what Ted made. Uh, he just had that talent. And, uh, even though I know that you know those of you who are not fisher people might not see fishing as a talent, we would go fishing all the time, and he would always outfish me, like every almost every single time. He would just he could figure things out that you couldn't figure out because he was just on that next level. Um, I I don't know. It's, it's hard. It's hard to express. I feel like there is nothing that he could try that he wouldn't be good at, uh, and it was kind of. Kind of sickening in a way because you, know, you, you try things like, well, I'll never be as good as him, so like, why even bother? But um, to, to close out and, and to hone you uh, onto something that um, one of these music guys said, I don't remember which one of you it was, uh, that he had this he had this spark. So whatever room he was in, you know, part of it was the comedy, part of it was the intelligence, part of it was the talent, uh, part of it was the thoughtfulness. But there was this ineffable quality about him, the spark that anytime he was in a room, it, it was different. There was like an electricity in it. Um, and we're talking about, you know, things that are missing now that he's gone. Um, but in another way, I feel like anybody who was around him, you know, we, we were touched by that spark. And so some part might be missing, but we still have it inside of us because we were around. So thank you, Ted, for the spark, and thank you guys for listening to me ramble. I really don't know why it is that all of us are so committed to the sea, except I think it's because in addition to the fact 
The sea changes, and the light changes, and ships change. It's because we all come from the sea. And it is an interestingly biological fact that all of us have in our veins the exact same percentage of salt in our blood that exists in the ocean. And therefore, we have salt in our blood, in our sweat, in our tears. We are tied to the ocean. When we go back to the sea, whether it is to sail or to watch it, we are going back from whence we came. If I may have Ted's sister-in-law, Dawn Victor, come up and, and say the prayer. join me in a prayer as we prepare to return Ted's ashes to God. Spirit of God, you were there at our birth, at our baptism, and our present at our death. Like this river, you flow where you choose. And although we cannot see you, we feel peace in your presence. Before Ted was born, he Floated in the water of a womb. God, you were there with him. When Ted professed his faith in you at his baptism, the baptismal waters washed over Ted and they were absorbed into his being. God, you were there with him. Throughout his life, Ted was drawn to water. God, were there with him. Your scripture tells us that Jesus is the living water and goes to prepare a place for us. And we trust that you were with Ted when he died. Eternal God, you have shared with us the life of Ted. Before he was ours, he is yours. For all that Ted has given us to make us what we are, for that which lives and grows in each of us, and for his life that in your love will never end, we give thanks. As we prepare to release Ted back into your water, comfort us in our loneliness. Strengthen us in our weakness and give us courage to face the future unafraid. Draw those of us who remain in this life close to one another and give us that peace and joy, which is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. At this time, I invite those of you who wish to come with us to the water's edge so we may return Ted to God.
Thank you.